This episode of the Trek Geeks podcast is brought to you by our brand new podcast, Talking Trek. That's right, Star Trek Discovery is coming soon, and we're proud to launch this very special companion podcast in May 2017. Join us every week as we examine and analyze every episode, character, story arc, and more from the brand new Star Trek series coming to CBS All Access this spring. For more information and to join our mailing list, please visit TalkingTrek.net. Hi, I'm Manu Reme. That's Unam Imnaritni backwards, and I played Echeb on Star Trek Voyager. You're listening to the Trek Geeks podcast with Bill Smith and Dan Davidson. Little show this side of the Alpha Quadrant. Welcome, one and all, to Trek Geeks, your independent Star Trek podcast, and episode 91 for the week of January 31st, 2017. I'm your co host, Bill Smith, and while joining me as he does this time every single episode, you might have heard of him. He's a drama queen and a low end podcaster and an Axidar super fan. He is uh, Garth of Izar's chamber boy. He's Dan Davidson. Dan, welcome aboard, buddy. If I was in the same room with you, I would punch you in the throat, man. <laughs> uh, I Drama love you queen, too. check. Low end podcaster, just following you. Everything else, <laughs> dude, dude, don't cross the line. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the line has been crossed. Oh. <laughs> Good to be here. Episode 91. They keep getting, you know, bigger by one every week. That's weird how that happens. Yeah, uh, some folks call it math. It's ah, very difficult. All right. I understand. No, I don't. We are, uh, we are fastly approaching our landmark 100th episode. Hard to believe. It's, it's amazing and hard to believe. Hard to believe. 100 episodes dealing with this every single week. But we do it for the fans because we love them. We've already generated more content than Axanar ever will. <laughs> you keep bringing up Axanar for some reason. I wonder why that is, Dan. Mm, yeah, well, the settlement. Good Lord, that came as a shock to a lot of people. Uh, we are going to be talking Axanar settlement today, and we are going to bring in none other than the expert in Axanar's uh, dealings in court over the last year, Mr. Carlos Pedraza, the man behind axamonitor.com. Carlos has such incredible experience in his career, both as a, a fan film writer and a producer and as a journalist, that he, he's the perfect person to this task. And honestly, I can't wait to talk to him. It's going to be a great discussion. I'm looking forward to it very much. Dan, I'm looking forward to you telling everyone at home how they could send us their comments, questions, concerns, and, you know, wishes to see you dressed as a chamber boy. Wow. Well, okay. On Twitter, Facebook, Skype, and Instagram, our handle is Trek Geeks. Uh, you can send us an email at podcast at trekgeeks.com. Call us at 508-784-1701 or go to speakpipe.com slash trekgeeks. And leave us a voicemail. Just that simple. Also, you can go to Camp Kittimer, which is our official Facebook group. Always good discussion going on there, especially with the settlement just happening. Uh, you're going to get early access to the episodes of the Trek Geeks podcast if you are a member. So go right on over to facebook.com slash groups slash Camp Kittimer. And uh, one of our three trusty admins will let you write in and you be can become part of the fun. Unless when Bill's posting and then it's not that fun. But anyway, wow. as a low-end podcaster and a drama queen, Bill, just remember that any comments or messages that you leave in any of those places, they might be used in a future episode. Oh, thanks, buddy. I Great love job. You, Thank I love you. you. I love you too. <laughs>
Dan, it's time for the news from treknews.net. <laughs> Spanning the Alpha Quadrant for all of the news of the Star Treks. It's treknews.net online at treknews.net. Dan, we've got a couple of stories this week. Um, the first of which is pretty entertaining. I don't have one of these devices myself, but I think you do. And <laughs> yeah. Currently, you can get the Amazon Echo to respond with a particular phrase. Yeah, this was cool. I saw this, just happened to be checking out treknews.net the other day, saw this, and I was like, what? Automatically set it up on my Echo Dot, and now, just like on the Enterprise, you can have your Amazon Echo or Echo Dot start responding to you by you saying, computer. (laughs) Oh my god, it's so cool. I tried it. It's fun. (laughs) <laughs> I could just see you sitting, you know, in your living room going, computer, play me the Spice Girls. Computer. Okay. Play me One Direction. <laughs> computer. <laughs> play me Los Del Rio. I will not confirm nor deny any of those examples. <laughs> it's very easy to do. You just go into the Echo app on your phone and uh, go into settings, and you have several different choices, but the newest one is computer. So check it out. It is really cool. I'm amazed you didn't do a Scotty impersonation, you know, from Star Trek Four. I don't do impersonations. Oh, I'm sorry. I must be thinking of another Dan Davidson. <laughs> a, ta- a talented one. Oh, wow. sick burn. Sick burn. Nice. Thank you. Dan, also at news this week, it appears that uh, Zoe Saldana, who of course plays Uhura in the uh, Kelvin Timeline movies, wants to play that part for a really long time. A very long time. She wants uh, Star Trek Four to happen, and she also hopes that uh, she can be doing this until she's in her 50s and 60s, and it would make her so happy. Quote, I would love, I would always come back to get the opportunity to be with all my friends until we're 50 or 60. I would be so happy. Happy end quote. Uh, so she loves the role. She loves working with all the uh, cast uh, that she's been working with for the three films so far. And um, hopefully with this whole rumors of Chris Hemsworth coming back to play George Kirk in the next Star Trek four, if it happens, uh, that'll be great to see Uhura back for that one. And hopefully for many more. I couldn't agree more. I think that it's great the way they've been writing Uhura, where she actually has stuff to do other than answer the phone. Mm, Hailing frequency is open. Right. And uh, I think that it it provides a a level of depth to the character we just really didn't see before. I mean, yeah, you know, in Star Trek 3, she, you know, um, puts the guy in the closet with a phaser. and, And beyond some other small scenes in some of the other movies, she really doesn't do much other than be a communications officer. So I think Zoe's portrayal of Uhura has been fantastic. And I'm glad to see that she's excited. Yes to play the part for a good long while. It's always nice to see um, actors that like doing the craft for the craft and not the paycheck. It sounds like she really enjoys it, uh, and let's hope that it continues for a long time to come. So, folks, uh, we are very happy to be joined today with uh, Carlos Pedraza. He is a screenwriter, producer, and the principal behind Axamonitor.com, the fact-checking and reporting that was created in the wake of the lawsuit against Axonar Productions and Alec Peters. He's also a former educator, associated press writer, and fan film producer. Three past lives which have all added a unique and wonderful perspective to his coverage of this whole mess. Uh, he now joins us on the Trek Geeks podcast to discuss the settlement of the Axonar case and what it may mean for fans like us. So, Carlos, welcome and happy birthday, buddy. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it's good to be here again with you guys. Talking to us has got to be the worst birthday party ever. Well, you know, the thing, the only thing that's making it, uh, like, I can only bear this because I'm eating lemon pie. <laughs> My birthday lemon pie. Wow. So, well, then I have to get a whole lot of lemon pie because I record with Bill every week. So oh, usually yeah. I just it. drink. So <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Some, some whiskey would be good. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. absolutely. So 
So, Carlos, you know, this whole odyssey started a little over a year ago. And um, I, I mean, really, you, you could have chosen to do what what really we have done and, and just sort of sort of watch things and, and comment on them. But what was it that made you decide to start Axa Monitor? Um, there, uh, there were a couple things. Uh, one was, uh, and I'm kind of embarrassed to admit this, but I, um, I've always wanted to start a wiki. Like I've, I've had, uh, I, I started one, uh, when I was with Star Trek Hidden Frontier, I created a, uh, a wiki for, for that fan film, uh, which they kept going for quite a few years after I left. Um, and I'm just a big fan. I'm a big fan of Wikipedia. Uh, I'm a big fan of just, you know, gathering information and then making it available and easy to find for, for people. Um, I've done that, you know, in jobs where I've worked. We've had internal wikis. And, um, uh, but I hadn't done it, you know, on my own for my own computer kind of a thing. Um, so I had this software that was just sitting there uh, for free. Uh, ready to use. And uh, as I was watching, you know, about the first month and a half of uh, the whole Axonar lawsuit controversy, it became really apparent to me that there were a lot of uh, wrong facts out there. Um, You know, quite apart from the case itself, just people weren't informed very well about how copyright law works and doesn't work, how it differs from trademark law. And they were, you know, the you know, we've all seen the the uh, amazingly loud fights online around mm. Axonar, and I felt like I could contribute at least a uh, common set of facts that people could use uh, and refer to uh, in in constructing their arguments. So, uh, so that's how. Plus, I was uh, waiting for some money to come in on uh, post production for my film, so I had some time. And uh, <laughs> those three things, you know, the devil. <laughs> The devil loves idle hands. Idle, idle hands are the devil's workshop. That's what it was. So it was my workshop. <laughs> Did you expect over the course of the entire year that we've gone through with through this and listening to everything that's going on, did you expect it to become as big as it has become in the Star Trek community? And by that, I mean, how much time do you put in on a daily basis on the website and getting everybody all the facts straight because there are so much there is so much misinformation out there? Uh, well, it varies day to day. Some days are, are way busy, busier than others. Uh, like last Friday, uh, when the <laughs> <laughs> when the settlement came out, uh, I was pretty much uh, on my feet. I work at a stand up desk, so I was pretty much on my feet for about twelve hours that day, um, uh, updating the story, um, doing interviews, getting reactions from people. Uh, you know, trying to figure out exactly what the uh, what the settlement says and doesn't say, and as it turns out, that's turning to be turning out to be a uh, a more complicated thing than you would expect. Uh, in as I've discovered in the last few days, um, so some days it can be a, a full a full day's work, um, but other times, you know, I'll go you know one two three days without doing very much at all, other than a, a short update. So it can really vary. Um, you know, during the dog days of summer, uh, I had to uh, really look for for uh stories on some days but uh mm-hmm. it pretty much proved to be um a, a story that you could follow on a day-by-day basis there was almost always uh every day some kind of axonar related story um right. for, for me to work on some complex some just updates but yeah it turned out to be quite a bit probably more than i banked on when i started but i tend to be kind of a pit bull. I don't let go of things once I, once I bite down. And, um, you know, and the, the other half of, of the answer to your first question really is related to this. And that's, uh, that, you know, having come up through the ranks of, of fan films, um, I, I, I know firsthand the value that they offer someone who wants to be a filmmaker professionally. And I know what kind of satisfaction they give people who love Star Trek. And, uh, I was, I feel like I was really privileged to have been able to, uh, take part of, of both of those things, uh, through the, the golden age of, of Star Trek fan films, which, um, unfortunately is probably over, but, but luckily fan films themselves are not. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I was concerned about, you know, how this would affect other, other fan producers, um, you know, people who wanted to start from scratch with their own fan films, the copyright issues were looking ominous. Um, and, uh, the way that, that Axanar was, was trying to, to fight back, I, I was afraid was going to, uh, 
make the fate even more ominous. So, um, so that was part of the reason why I got involved as well. And then the, the last part is, frankly, I just hate bullies. Um, and I saw so much of that happening in, uh, in the f- Facebook groups that discussed mm-hmm. Axanar, uh, where people who, loyal people, I mean, people who gave money, some of them tens, hundreds, you know, thousands of dollars who ended up being sort of kicked by, to the curb because they asked the wrong sorts of questions. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a, one little old lady who's written me probably three or four times saying she gave $125. She's on a fixed income. Mm-hmm. And she says she's been treated shabbily by them. She asked for a refund, was told point blank she would never get one. Wow. Um, and, you know, this is someone on a fixed income. And, um I don't know. I just I I felt like people like that needed to have a voice or at least know that there was someone out there trying to hold them accountable. Um and more than anything else that's what what motivates most of the stories that I do on Ax Monitor is just the idea that that 1.4 million dollars is a lot to be accountable for and and it's going to be even more than that, than that going into uh the next phase of of uh Axonar's life. And uh, people deserve to know how their money was spent or was not spent, and there weren't, uh, there wasn't a, a lot going on in a in a coordinated way uh, to get the answers to that. There are other people uh, besides myself who've 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 been digging into this story, but um, you know, but they would post things on you know Facebook groups and they'd be buried down in threads. And so part mm. of my job was to have a website that people could turn to, and it would always be there. Well, it's a great website. There's lots of information. We certainly recommend everybody uh, uh, check it out. Um, if you could, Carlos, would it be possible for you to give us a very high-level Reader's Digest version of the lawsuit as it as it happened over the course of the year for anyone who may not be familiar with it? Sure. So uh, Axanar, uh, which started out being called Star Trek Axanar, uh, was a fan film. Uh, led by Alec Peters, and they produced a very uh, well done, in my opinion, um, uh, trailer to help raise money for a feature film that they wanted to do, which told the story of Garth of Izar, uh from the third season episode of the original series called Whom Gods Destroy. He was uh, considered one of Starfleet's best captains, if not its best captain, uh, up until Kirk, of course. And um, uh, Alec Peters always looked at at him uh up to him as some sort of hero and decided he wanted to make uh, a feature film about it so they made prelude to axanar which was done sort of in the in the uh style of a history channel documentary um which hadn't really been done to that extent before in star trek and so uh so it got a lot of buzz uh it was very interesting he attracted some uh fantastic uh talent uh well-known uh star trek actors or genre actors um, and so they went on their way through three rounds of crowdfunding to ultimately raise, uh, you know, $1.4 million. Um, and the problem was that they started advertising themselves as not a fan film anymore. And in mm-hmm. fact, going out of their way to, to say, we are not a fan film and saying instead that they were a fully independent professional Star Trek or fully professional independent Star Trek production. Well, that set off alarm bells at, um, at CBS and Paramount because uh, creating professional Star Trek productions is their job. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's, what, it's what people pay, pay them to do. And um, so they warned Alec at a meeting in August 2015 in Las Vegas that he needed to uh, watch what he was doing, uh, not just because of the film that he was making, but because he had actually set up an entire set of commercial enterprises surrounding this this film that he wanted to make, Axanar. Uh, they included a, an extensive line of merchandise. Uh, they included uh, the building out of a commercial soundstage and studio facility um, that they intended to rent out uh, for income, uh, as well as to produce other uh, films, uh, not just fan films, but other um, science fiction genre uh, films, uh, uh, presumably to their own eventual profit. Um, and those are the kinds of alarm bells that, that those of us who were in the fan film community knew were not the kind of alarms we wanted to be setting off with CBS and 
uh, and or Paramount. And so they sued. They sued and they said, look, we have for, for 40, over 40 years um, uh, turned a blind eye, uh, tolerated the use of our, of our intellectual property because it's being done from love, number one. And number two, people weren't making money out of it. Well, in 2015, 2014, 2015, someone started making money off of it, and a lot. You know, um, they were well on their way to a budget of two million dollars for Axanar, so this would have been a multi-million dollar uh, spectacular effort, and it uh, was not being well received. Um, and and further by by the studios, and furthermore, it wasn't just that they were raising a lot of money; it's that they were laying the groundwork. They were basically using money that was raised under the auspices, the the name of Star Trek, to fund a, a private business and. Uh, uh, Axanar claimed uh, throughout its uh, d- legal defense that it was not uh, a commercial business, but the judge looked at all of the evidence that both sides uh, presented in their motions for summary judgment and, in fact, ruled, number one, that Axanar was a commercial uh, enterprise, and number two, that Alec Peters um, uh, engaged in uh, at least as much infringement as the judge by himself could uh, could rule upon, um, and that there was part of that uh, determination that did require a, a jury to uh, to make a, a decision about. And then the third thing was that um, he profited from this. Uh, he personally profited from this effort, uh, even if he didn't infringe the copyright, the, the judge found quite apart from that, that Alec Peters, in fact, did uh, profit personally from uh, the money that was raised. So uh, so those were three pretty big findings, and they were ones that kind of um, uh, gutted the, uh, the center of the defense case, uh, and I think probably was one of the big reasons why we ended up getting this settled uh, 11 days before it was to go to trial. And I think that settlement was pretty surprising to a lot of people. I know it was to to both Dan and myself, because all the talk we had heard up until then was, you know, we're going to take this all the way to the Supreme Court if we have to, and certainly through the uh, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. So in the, getting toward the settlement now, essentially, what is he allowed to do? He's allowed to make a film called Axanar. Um, he's not allowed to make a feature film called Axanar. So for donors who gave uh, a lot of money for a, you know, 90 minute or so feature length film about the story of Axanar and Captain Garth of Izar, uh, they are instead getting uh, two 15 minute episodes. So a total of 30 minutes um, of, of a story. And that's what he's being allowed to, to produce under the terms of the settlement. Um, he is not allowed to raise any more money publicly through, uh, through crowdfunding. Um, it's not clear exactly how far into the public that extends. Is it just crowdfunding or is it any kind of public fundraising appeal? Uh, I just published a story last night uh, or yesterday that uh, that uh, discovered that there's still public appeals on their websites even today, uh, like this, today, this very day, uh, asking people, telling people, you know, click here to donate and... Um, and even though they can't directly give the money right away uh, on, on the website, what they ask for, what Axonar asks for, is their email address. Because once they have their email address, you see, it's no longer a public fundraising effort, it's a private one. And the settlement allows them to raise as much private money as they want. So it's kind of a, uh, an end run around the uh, constraints uh, against public fundraising by instead saying, well, just give us your email. And then once you have the email, using that as your pretext for uh, a private outreach to, to raise still more money. So I don't know if the, if the settlement, uh, the letter of the settlement strictly pro- prohibits that, but it certainly goes against the spirit of it. That's a very good point. I was actually going to bring up uh, that article that you just referred to uh, later on, but I'll, but I'll talk about it now because because I guess my question is, in my opinion, it's only a matter of time before Mr. Peter's ego causes him to do to go overboard and do something that's clearly stated in the settlement as something that he can't do. Um, if and when that happens, what do you think CBS and Paramount would and should do? And is this example of the donate button and the private something that they could latch on to as a breach of that settlement at some point? 
Well, I'm sure that uh, that the settlement has provisions in it for uh, what constitutes a breach and uh, and what can be done in the event of a breach. Uh, and it may be uh, one of degrees. If it's a certain kind of breach, then uh, this you know these kinds of, of settlements often will have some sort of uh, monetary penalty um, for certain kinds of breaches. Or they may actually allow for a new lawsuit to be uh, to be brought, um, uh, alleging that uh, that the the breach uh, constitutes some sort of violation of their civil uh, their their rights under copyright law. So, uh, as we know, he raised you know pretty close to a million and a half dollars. Um, I assume that he had to disclose those financials to the court at some point, but it's pretty much common knowledge that the money is, is just, it's gone and there's obviously no film. So I suppose that the question that, that we have as donors and that other donors have raised on our, our camp Kittimer Facebook group is, is there any way to find out exactly where the million and a half dollars went? The only way, uh, well, if it had gone to trial, you would have found that out. Okay. Mm. Um, because it would have been part of uh, uh, of the evidence that would have been submitted to the jury uh, to consider in uh, in their deliberations around what kinds of damages uh, they might impose upon uh, Axonar if they were found to be liable for copyright infringement. So, um, so that's how it would have happened with the settlement. Uh, presumably, uh, almost all of that evidence that would have been entered is now safe from public view, um, hidden from public view. Um, and the only thing that, uh, that would entice, uh, the folks at Axonar to make it public would be some kind of, uh, moral outrage. Um, the only other way that that information could come out is if another suit, uh, were brought, um, for example, a class action suit by, uh, by donors uh, who could claim that uh, they're owed refunds under their uh, the, the contract that was created between them and Axonar as part of the terms of uh, of Kickstarter and, and Indiegogo, um, and if they uh, if they sued him, they would get the same right to discovery that CBS and Paramount had, and uh, so then they would they would be able to get that evidence as well. But that's the only way it's going to happen is if there's some sort of, of legal measure brought against them uh, through which you have uh, discovery occur that would focus on getting a hold of those financials. That's interesting. Can you clarify something for me, Carlos? Because I remember at one point there was information out there, but two different sets of information in regards to expenses. Um, were those official documents or was that a... Is, was that something that somebody was, you know, just, you know, guessing what could have been going on? I remember seeing something about that at some point. Yeah, there's, um, there's, it's actually not totally clear what the extent of formal financial records were turned over in, as part of discovery, uh, because we heard one thing from the plaintiffs, we heard another thing from the defendants, and yet another thing from the defendants' lawyers. So um, so there's not a clear-cut answer to that. What we do know is that some records were turned over, and they were records of expenses um, that totaled 215 pages. Um Wow. And but that may you know that may just be that's not necessarily like a ledger that may literally be just a printout of uh, from Quicken of you know yesterday we spent this today we spent mm. that it was in, in this line item and and so there's not necessarily any any actual uh, examination uh, from an accounting standpoint of those uh, of those expenses so we know that um, that there was an initial batch large batch of those kinds of uh, records that were turned over um, in uh, in discovery. Uh, then it turned out that um, the plaintiffs discovered that uh, Alec Peters had not turned over everything that he should have turned over in discovery, and so they um, they asked for a second deposition um, from him, and um, and his lawyers uh, asked to be allowed to enter into evidence a. 
I guess you could call it a cleaned up version of the financial records. <laughs> um, now, what cleaned up really means is hard to say because, of course, his lawyer describes it one way, which is basically uh, – uh, to sum it up, that first batch was just a mess, and we handed it over because it was discovery, and so we turned it over. But now we've cleaned it up, and and this second set is the one that that you should use. Uh, the jury <laughs> should see in determining, um, you know, what happened to the money. A couple of problems with that is, and, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> you know, from uh, for for several months now. Um, Alec Peters has been claiming that he uh, put in one hundred and fifty thousand dollars of his own money into uh, into Axinar, um, and uh, but we have yet to see any actual documentation of that. And in fact, when I interviewed the members of his uh, so-called independent financial review committee, uh, the two of them who went uh, who discussed it at any length. Uh, both told me that there was, they did not see that hundred and fifty thousand dollars accounted for in any formal way in the in the records that they examined, um, which says to me that they didn't examine all the records. Mm-hmm. Um, and as it turns out, even Alec Peters admits that they are not examining all the records. They are examining, in his words, a subset of the records. That subset are the ones that he chose for them to look at. Um, there is another subset that consists of other financial transactions to which he believes he is not accountable to that financial review committee or the donors. Um, and in that gray area of what he believes is, uh, is information meant only for him um, is this $150,000. Um, the, the big difference between those two sets of books that, um, that you're asking about is that one The first set, the so-called mess of a set, shows that uh, a large number, tens of thousands of dollars at the very least, uh, were spent on what could be construed as personal expenses. Mm -hmm. Uh, Restaurant bills, tires, car maintenance, health insurance, uh, cell phone bills. That's just a start. Um, And then the second cleaned up version, those personal expenses no longer appear. Wow. And the reason they no longer appear, according to the plaintiffs, and to some extent also according to what uh, Alec Peters has said, is he reversed out those personal expenses. Basically, he reimbursed Axinar with $150,000. And again, we don't actually know if that's a true amount. Uh, but let, for the sake of argument, let's say it is. Um, he says he, that uh, he's paid all that back, and therefore... Uh, donors can rest assured that all of their money, all the money they gave was in fact spent only on the film that was never produced. Um, I have a quick question on that, if I could, Bill. It sounds like you're about to ask a question, too. Um, Do you know the timing of when that supposed um, repaying back Axonar took place? Because if it took place after the initial mess accounting document came out, that would seem to be someone's hand caught in the cookie jar and like, oh, my God, I better take care of this so that then they can't say that I did something wrong. Did that supposed $150,000 take place before or after? Uh, that's not really clear. And the, okay. the, one, of the, one of the problems is that because all of this is being done after the fact, mm-hmm. um, you know, it's like you can't steal a cookie – and then put another cookie back and claim that you never stole the first cookie. You <laughs> stole the first cookie. You just got another cookie later and right. and put it back in and hope no one would notice. But you actually did steal a cookie. So there's a you know 1.5 million cookies uh, at play here. <laughs> and 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 what's happened is that um, uh, you know th- I, I think Alec Peters is is trying to justify money that he was obligated to spend uh, on the the rent and utilities of his commercial studio because it's not completed yet. They put in anywhere from five hundred to nine hundred thousand dollars into the build out and rent of this uh, of this facility and it is still not ready to open for business. Um, consequently, uh, as of May, according to the to my reporting, as of May, they were out of money. Um, and that forced him to have to put 
uh, up some of his own money to pay to keep the rent going, to keep the lights mm-hmm. on. Right. Um, and I believe from what he – the way he phrases it, he believes that the money he paid in rent since around May or so of 2016 – uh, is quote unquote paying back donors for the personal expenses that they had paid for originally for him. Um, but the, the only problem with that is, of course, that uh, he had to pay that no matter what. You know, his name is on the lease. He himself is personally liable for the rent, not just Axonar Productions, the company, but he himself, Alec Peters, is personally liable for the rent. So he had no choice in the matter. He had to put money in or he'd lose the facility. So this notion that somehow he was being, you know, uh, uh, philanthropic and and, uh, good-hearted by putting in so much of his own money... um, is it's it's a bit of a stretch given the fact that that he was under some great obligation to do that no matter what. Wow. You know, Carlos, you you've been involved with fan films for quite a while. I mean, between Hidden Frontier and New Voyages, you know, the latter for which you you wrote it a, a wonderful script with with Blood and Fire based on David Gerald's uh, original story idea. Um, have you ever seen anything like this? <laughs> um, well, certainly not on the scale. I mean, it is. It is for sure, um, when it comes to scale, way out above anybody else. Uh, the the closest you'll see is um, uh, probably th- three efforts. Uh, one was uh, Mark Scott Zakri's uh, World Enough in Time, uh, mm-hmm. which was done uh, as part of, of Star Trek New Voyages. Um, I was one of the executive producers on that and also the script supervisor on that. And um, Mark's hope for that um for that episode uh which starred george takei reprising his role as as mr sulu was that um was that it could be made at a sufficiently professional level that cbs would be interested in uh in taking it and using it in in marketing it and selling it uh to people um and that he obviously would would have a share in that but you know he actually raised money from investors with that hope in mind um, and while I think the the result from a creative standpoint uh, and a quality standpoint was super super high, uh, and we hadn't seen anything to date like that uh, out of a out of a fan production, um, CBS never really bit. So um, you know, for a lot of reasons, you know, one is uh, th- they probably thought it might send the wrong message in terms of of fans thinking that th- this is the kind of thing that they could do, and then they'd have to deal with all these fan films that were trying to, to be real Star Trek. Um, so it just, it never happened. Um, uh, although it went on to win some wonderful awards, which was great. The Definitely. second, the second effort was, um, Star Trek of gods and men, uh, which was also a, a, a pretty big effort. I worked on that one too, as a, uh, as a, a script supervisor, it was shot also on the, uh, Star Trek new voyages sets. And, um, it had, gosh, almost anyone you can imagine from Star Trek, from the various iterations of Star Trek in that, uh, in that cast. It was a huge cast. It was a sprawling story. It covered a lot of territory, kind of a, a bit on the kitchen sink level. But it was, it was begun, uh, established as a project by Sky Conway, who I think also hoped that it could be pivoted into something, uh, I- into something of, of greater financial merit down the line. Um, and that didn't quite happen either. Uh, although it ended up being pretty, pretty well regarded, uh, when it, when it came out. So that was number two. And then number three, uh, also from Sky Conway is Star Trek Renegades, which, um, he, uh, also was able to, to attract a lot of Star Trek alumni to appear in it. And it had, um, you know, Star Trek writers who had worked on, on Star Trek, uh, Deep Space Nine, I believe. And, um, uh, tried to 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 launch a, a new series, a spinoff series um, that starred a lot of the same a lot of the same actors, and um, uh, they raised um, I don't know half a million, seven hundred thousand, something like that to yeah. to make it. Um, and you know, up until Axanar, it was the the one that raised the most money, and um, I got this sense that there was some some concerns starting to be raised over uh in in cbs uh over at cbs and paramount um because it was now 
it was now moving away from a purely fan-driven uh, endeavor into something that was starting to have more and more sort of commercialized aspects to it. Renegades never went, never crossed the the line as far as CBS and Paramount were concerned, but they may have, you know, towed it. <laughs> they might have come up <laughs> up to the line. Uh, and to their and and to their credit, um, when they were told to back off, they backed off. And when they were uh, when the guidelines came out last summer, uh, they decided to shave you know scrape off the serial numbers and turn Renegades into a non Star Trek project um, uh, to stand on its own two feet. And that's uh, uh, that's what they've done. Um, but even at that, they're now in, in production or post production, I guess now uh, of their their second episode and I think their final episode, but I'm not sure about that. Um, and uh, that should be coming out uh, at some point, but it will be without any uh, explicit Star Trek um, references in it. Right. right. Um, I'm going to read a quote to you, Carlos, which I know that you know of, um, and I'd like to get your comment on it. Um, uh, Mr. Peters was recently quoted, to me personally, in my own opinion, it's, it feels more, nothing more than backstabbing the fan film community. Uh, but he said, quote, it's a shame that the fan film community decided to turn against each other in this process because sticking together would have allowed us maybe to reach a better settlement, end quote. Um, do you know of anybody that uh, turned against each other uh, other than people turning against Axanar? And have you had any response from any other film, fan film productions in regards to that comment? Um, uh, yeah, I, I have heard informally from other um, fan producers um, – who are pretty angry about being characterized in that way, uh, because in point of fact, and as and as we reported on Axe Monitor, um, shortly after after the guidelines were announced, uh, while there was sort of an initial wave of of dread uh, and fear and uncertainty uh, around those guidelines, most of those productions have come back and are and are adhering to those guidelines. Star Trek fan films are far from dead; um, they're now operating in a uh, in a safe zone, a safe harbor that's been created uh, from the from by CBS and Paramount, uh, these are good things. We have lost some things uh, for sure, and there are things you know I mourn their passing as well. I would love right. you know there to be continuing series and and uh, hour long episodes and you know all the things that 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 were lost. Uh, those would have been great to to have been able to have kept, but given the the very clear threat that uh commercial threat that Axanar uh, uh posed to to the studios who own Star Trek um it's not surprising that they went uh that far in that direction uh, around the constraints on on fan producers so mm-hmm. um so at that time um you know I I reported this story in which um uh, in which uh, Alec Peters had gathered a, a secret group of, of around eight or nine people, fan producers, to uh, to join him in um, in proposing a set of uh, of guidelines to CBS and Paramount that um, that were things that he could live with, that he Alec Peters could live with, and that presumably, if you look at it, there are all kinds of little loopholes in there that would have allowed for certain kinds of continued merchandising and. Um, uh, different time limits and and so forth. It would have just been a lot more um, lenient than the than the guidelines actually turned out to be. Um, and through that process, um, you know, when I was reporting it, I um, I got this information from from more than one source. Um, I was not going to name any of the of the fan producers because I didn't feel like it was that important to the story. Okay. The story was about the guidelines, not about, uh, you know, the, the fan producers who were sort of roped into this conversation by, by, uh, Alec Peters. And so, but then he found out that I, that I, that I found out because I called, um, his spokesman and asked for a comment on this. And so in the dead of night, like literally about two o'clock in, in the morning, he gave an interview to, uh, blogger Dave Higney. I think that's how you pronounce Dave's name. Um, in which he actually disclosed the names of of the uh, the participants in this in this discussion. Uh, so once he disclosed them, I disclosed them because they were out there. But right. um, 
you know, he he uh, made these claims that somehow I had disclosed their names, and you can look at the timestamps pretty clearly. He he <laughs> he was out there first, um, and so anyway. That but to your point, um, these folks did not turn on each other. There's no, no evidence of that anywhere. Uh, if anything, they united um, to both uh, uh, proclaim that they would be living with the guidelines and uh, that they uh, were disavowing any participation uh, that they'd had with Alec Peters in him coming up with his own set of guidelines. And, you know, the thing that I I think is really important to point out here is, you know, he had a vested financial interest in the outcome of this lawsuit. And Mm -hmm. and he had a vested financial interest in what those guidelines would allow and would not allow in terms of commercialization or monetization of Star Trek under the auspices of, of, of fan film guidelines. Um, so the idea that he was sort of trying to save fan films, uh, you know, it, I, I, I'm not comfortable with that characterization because there's a clear uh, financial interest on his part that uh, needed to be at least pointed out, uh, which I did, uh, for people to decide on their own whether or not uh, his characterization, A, of him being the savior of fan films, and B, these other fan films supporting him, and then C, uh, in not supporting him, him trying to turn it around into them turning on each other. I think I think his new, uh, his new quote, which he made just in, in his podcast that was released on the 26th of January, um, is just revisionist history. It's taking uh, a little bit of truth that, yes, there was a, t- a turning on by fan film producers on somebody – but he neatly avoids pointing out that somebody was pretty much just him, and, um, uh, and, and you know, and that's that's how that turned out. I mean, he uh, he he has taken um, little things that that are true, and then tries to cast a different light on them, even though we have, you know, in black and white or you know, r- recorded on audio or video, him saying uh, something uh, quite quite different um Mm -hmm. you know he he talked about for example in the podcast about uh he just he said other people everybody was has been describing these guidelines as draconian but i'm really excited about being able to produce even a half hour of (laughs) axonar under them and i'm like you know (laughs) you were actually the one who called them draconian Draconian. you (laughs) did um rob my robert meyer burnett the the director of of axonar used the word draconian um you're the ones who who talked about i mean there's a quote that he gave the rap in which he said that if if cbs and paramount wanted to kill fan films there was no better way than these guidelines 7 months later after surviving a lawsuit all of a sudden these guidelines are wonderful and an opportunity and he's quote unquote excited as hell about yes. it yes <laughs> I'm sure he is. <laughs> so there's there's two examples of how uh, how he's shading history in in a way that that makes him look better today than he actually looked back then. So we, we've got a couple more questions from Camp Kittimer for you, Carlos. Um, you know, we'd ask people what concerns they had about uh, the, the lawsuit and the settlement, or what general questions they had for for you in particular, and. And one of the questions is, if CBS was to lift or alter the fan film guidelines and allow certain other productions to continue, wink, wink, um, <laughs> what they were doing, would Alec and Axenar still be limited by the verdict that was handed down in the court, or would that open the door to the whole thing starting up again? Uh, that's a good question, because the answer is both yes and no. So here's the thing. The thing to understand about the guidelines is that they are not rules. They are not uh, they're, they're not laws that CBS is going out of its way to enforce. What they've done is that they have drawn a boundary inside of which, if you are a fan producer and you make a film inside of those boundaries, you will not be sued. That's all they really mean. Right. So if you do something outside of those boundaries, it does not guarantee that you will be sued. It just says you can be sued. And, it's a, and is it their discretion? It's at their discretion. That's the, yeah. under copyright law. They get to decide uh, uh, who to take legal action against. And and part of right. the reason why they haven't taken legal action in almost 50 years of history is because fan films were just little things. They made no money. They could make no money. Um, and, it, you know, what good does it do them to 
to to sue people for no money. I mean, they'd be <laughs> laughed out of court because you know if there's no damage, there's no there's no liability. Um, so, um, so for for fan films um, operating within the guidelines, they they're in the clear uh, according to CBS and and Paramount. Once you're outside of them. Um, you're not in a, in any different position from a legal standpoint than you were two years ago before Axanar. Um, it was a gray area in which uh, you had to be careful about not being viewed as making money because then they'd come after you. I mean, that's basically what we... Um, the atmosphere in which we operated. If you if you listen to John Van Sitters in his uh, podcast uh, last June, the Engage podcast, in which he uh, discussed the the new guidelines, one of the things he said was, you know, we didn't think we needed guidelines because it was pretty clear that there were like two rules. One was, if you love it, do it, and the second, don't make any money at it. Right. And he says he said, well, we thought that was pretty obvious what that meant. And as it turns out, it, it wasn't because, um, you know, Axanar created all these rationalizations around, well, we're not making a profit. And you said we couldn't make a profit. But as it turns out, and the judge found this to be so, uh, there was still money going into people's pockets um, or, or benefiting them in some direct financial way uh, that uh, even, if you, even if you could count them as legitimate business expenses... Um, you know, because if you have a meal and, and the company pays for it, it may be a legitimate business expense, but it's still, you're still benefiting from, uh, from that meal, uh, because you didn't have to use your own money for that particular dinner or lunch. So, um, so for, for fan films looking towards the future, um, you know, I think, uh, what John Van Sitter said of that ABC or that CBS will do is, you know, we're not we're not going to force people to to send us scripts or approve cast lists. They're just not going to do that. That costs money. They shouldn't be having to spend money policing fan films. Um, what it does mean is they're going to you know they'll keep an eye out, and if something uh, appears to be happening out of line, like say raising one point four million dollars. Um, they're they're going to be much more likely to to take action, but they said they're going to make those decisions on a case by case basis. So they'll evaluate each one and really look at okay, if there's a concern, how can you tell us this is not something we should be be concerned about? And they may be okay with that. So as far as Star Trek continues is concerned, Star Trek continues uh, made a commitment to its donors that it would make X number of episodes with the money that they gave, and they are well on their way to doing that. CBS knows this. Uh, Star Trek Continues is very transparent financially, um, despite what Axanar claims. Um, you know, they claim themselves as being the most transparent and accountable um, fan film out there. But the fact of the matter is that uh, f- to get their uh, nonprofit status, um, Star Trek Continues had to put all of its financials out there. It had to be looked at by the government and signed off on before they got that tax exemption. Uh, Axonar to date has never withstood that kind of examination or scrutiny of its uh, of its finances. The closest they've ever gotten is the report I did of their of their annual report from 2015, and all it did was raise red flags. So um, to this date, we still don't know how much work an accountant has or has not done with Axanar's books. Um, you know, uh, back in April of last year, um, uh, Axanar spokesman Mike Bodden told me that they were, you know, getting a, an accountant to come on board right away to get its finances in order. And it turns out that that accountant, if it, if he or she ever came on board, it wasn't until, um, you know, much closer to the to the scheduled trial date uh, during discovery. So, um, so there's been lots of um, uh, skimming around what the truth may be around Axnar's finances, and and uh, uh, continues uh, by contrast has been uh, much more open. And CBS obviously is aware of them, and if they think they do any are going to do anything um, that treads on their uh, on their territory, they'll they'll take action. But that's 
theirs to uh, their decision to make as the the copyright holder. All right. Um, one other uh, camper has uh, would like to hear your thoughts on how Alec is spinning this settlement as such a win for he and his uh, fans. Um, by all, I mean, not being, you know, forced to pay millions of dollars back to CBS, I guess could be a positive thing, but, um, all of the spin that we've seen since the settlement, what's your take on that from their perspective? Well, you know, initially it was, um, I, I wasn't very cynical about it because, um, this is pretty standard in, in lawsuits when you have a settlement, both sides come out saying they won. Um, and so, you know, that's pretty pretty normal, pretty standard oper- operating procedure. So I didn't, um, I didn't quibble too much about it. You know, I mean, uh, if you accept, uh, his definition of, of winning as being a, you know, 30 minute version of Axanar versus a 90 minute version of Axanar, then sure, it's a win. If you accept, um, uh, if you accept, uh, his definition of winning as I'm not having to pay, you know, millions of dollars in, in damages, then, great you you you're a winner um but uh you know it, it, all you have to do is look in the other direction and just see sort of the destruction uh in in its wake and uh there there aren't really any winners that that have come out of this i mean um uh, you know we we know of of fan films out there that had invested thousands of, of dollars in their sets and their costumes and things like that, that um, they've had to scrap because they decided either they weren't going to proceed or they were going to um, uh, convert their, their fan film into a non-Star Trek fan film and they needed to start their production design all over again. Um, so there, there are lots of people who are losers and, and those folks are losers uh, because of whatever victory um, Axanar has been able to scrape out of this. Um, so that was where I was on like Saturday. And then a few days after that, in uh, a Facebook group, I saw uh, uh, an Axonar supporter, Colin Crap, make uh, a claim that um, that Alec Peters had not actually uh, admitted to any kind of copyright infraction. Uh, despite the fact that there was, you know, there was an announcement called a joint statement that at, whose name <laughs> at the top said CBS, Paramount, Alec Peters, and Axnar Productions. And that joint statement says, in that joint statement, he admits to uh, having overstepped uh, the boundaries of what AB, uh, CBS and, and Paramount found acceptable uh, for the use of their, of their copyrights. Um, and so, okay, you know, I, I read this, uh, him saying, well, he didn't actually admit it. Uh, and he, he quoted Mike Bodden, XNR spokesman, as having told him this. And I thought, this is kind of weird. So I, I uh, wrote Mike. Um, he and I communicate pretty, pretty frequently. And I said, Mike, uh, this guy's quoting you as saying that Alec hasn't actually admitted uh, that he uh, overstepped the copyright boundaries. And uh, he, and I said, is that true? Can you clarify this for me? And he did the opposite of clarify. He said, well, Hmm. they put out their statement and then we put out our statement and then we put out another statement, this one just for donors. And that's all I'm going to tell you, Carlos. Wow. And so I said, well, you know, Mike, are, are you saying that this joint statement that has your name on it, the defendant's name, not Mike's personally, the defendant's name at the top, that that somehow, that you don't agree with the wording that appears in that? And he refused to answer. So, uh, because in his own statements uh, that Axonar put out, there's no mention whatsoever of copyright. Right. And so, you know, so it's it's this alternative fact that he didn't admit... (laughs) That he didn't admit anything, um, even though there's a joint statement that says that he did. Um, and, uh, you know, the other thing Mike Bodden told me was, um, look, if anyone, uh, if either of the parties uh, believed that the, uh, that the statements put out by uh, their opposing parties was inaccurate, you would have heard something by now. It's been five days. I'm like, well, okay, that kind of makes sense. But then I actually looked at the statements and I realized, well... They don't contradict each other. They're not, none of them is inaccurate on its face. 
It's just the Axnar ones omit the admission. <laughs> like it never happened. And so uh, so when, when Colin Crap on Facebook says, this is just conjecture. That's what he, the word he used for, uh, for Alec Peters' admissions about overstepping copyright. He says, that's just conjecture. Well, so different financial books, different statements. It all sounds the same. Yeah, I, you know, <laughs> it's and and people wonder why I have sunk my teeth into this story for a year, um, because uh, you know they want to portray it as some sort of vendetta or anything. But it's like all I'm trying to find is get a straight answer on something. Like, did you spend money like this? Did you sign a sign onto a joint statement or not? Um, you know. Pretty straightforward questions that I <laughs> believe should have straightforward answers. And instead, we get this obfuscation. We get, um, you know, uh, 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 personal attacks as deflections away from the actual, uh, from the original question. And all of these things, uh, to me, say there's something going on there that people deserve to know. Particularly since, th- since it was uh, built upon funds that were raised publicly. Um, and there's an, an accountability there that uh, Axenar owes people, owes the public, um, to, for, from whom they sought uh, all this money that they've gone and spent without producing what they promised. Um, they owe it. And so I felt like I'm in a position to be able to at least look into it and clarify the questions that should be uh, that should be asked of Axenar. And, and that's what ax monitor is for speaking of conjecture <laughs> i think that easily one of the most repeated um uh, alternative facts from the pro action or crowd especially because the lawsuit was dropped right after the announcement of of the new star trek series and both action and star trek discovery seem to take place in roughly the same time period and they both deal with klingons um is is there any credibility to the assertion that, it, based on the similarities, it looks like CBS saw the alleged wave of popularity of Axonar and decided, well, hey, we could do this ourselves? You know, there's there's a, a, an old Latin phrase uh, that's used to describe uh, logical fallacies. Um, Post hoc ergo propter hoc. It literally means after this, Therefore, because of this, and it's how a logical fallacy is described in which just because one thing happened after another thing doesn't mean that the second thing was caused by the first. Um, and that's that's all there is for these these theories about uh, discovery and Axonar. And if you if you look into them with any kind of, of critical thinking, you see pretty quickly that they fall apart. For example, uh, Klingons. There have been Klingons in every iteration of Star Trek there has ever been. <laughs> so the fact that there are Klingons in Discovery and also Klingons in Axanar means absolutely nothing. You know, there's there, there's no connection between those things. Um, you know, the, the, the time frame issue. It's like, well, Discovery set in exactly the same year that Prelude was set in. And I'm like, okay, true. But let's backtrack a little here and 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 parse what we mean when we say the same year Prelude is set in. The year that Prelude is set in is not the year in which the Battle of Axanar happened. It's the year in which this faux documentary was made for a faux uh, television or holovision network in a faux federation in a faux universe, all of which none of which exists. <laughs> so. It's a lot. (laughs) So, I mean, this notion that, okay, um, that because Discovery said in the same year that a a television broadcast was was made doesn't mean that it's in the same time frame as as uh, as Axanar. The the that actually had happened 20 years before that. Um, 10 or 20, I forget exactly. But the idea is that the Battle of Axanar had happened long before the year in which discovery is set. And anyone who tries to point to prelude as, uh, as proof isn't really looking at what prelude purports to be, which is a, uh, a documentary that was made decades after, um, after the, uh, the things, which it's uh, the events, uh, which it depicts. Interesting. Well, 
Carlos, we got one more question for you. It's kind of a two-part question. Uh, the first is one of our, our uh, folks on Camp Kittimer wants to know if you accept donations for Axomonitor's site to stay up and running. Um, and to tie off into that, the next question would be, regardless of your answer, I would say, is what's next for you and Axomonitor now that the settlement is done and we have this time frame in front of us that we don't know what's going on? I would really love to get the answers to those two things as well. Um, <laughs> it it kind of depends. Um, you know, I, I do have a, a real job. Uh, you know, I have a, a film that's uh, we're just wrapping up post-production now, and we've got our world premiere in Australia in, uh, in about uh, a month. Um, and then we'll be doing uh, uh, film festival appearances for the next year, probably, and then hopefully get it into distribution and, and on cable and maybe even into theaters if everything goes well. Um, so that's kind of what uh, my priority has to be at this point. Um, but at the same time, um, I, I feel like I have an obligation to people who uh, have relied on Axe Monitor as a, as a source of, of information uh, to not just drop the story. And I think there's still uh, plenty of the story to tell. Um, you know, if it had just been a quiet settlement and and it was all over, then sure, maybe I'd, I'd think in terms of, you know, this is time for this to come to an end. But as uh, I pointed out from, from my um, most recent article yesterday, there's still some stuff going on under the surface here that uh, mm. I think requires um, some, some due diligence in, uh, in examining. And so this notion of the, the public appeals for, for money and uh, what private fundraising actually looks like. Uh, I mean, there's even less accountability for private fun fundraising than there is from crowdfunding. But as far as CBS and, and Paramount are concerned, it's like, you know, whatever you want to do with people that you deal with in a, in a private way is is up to you. But if you're going to do use our name, use our copyright, use our product to raise money from the public, then you can only do it under these very strict um, uh, rules. Um, so uh, it seems to me like there's still, you know... Alec Peters can call this a, a victory, but it's not a victory until uh, until something is actually produced. And so far, he has uh, proven himself um, not super capable at producing things. Um, consequently, uh, you know, they, they're completely out of money. You know, their own expert financial witness said so in evidence that was submitted um, to the judge. Uh, they have no money. Uh, if they have no money... That means they can't fulfill perks. They can't. Uh, they can't uh, spend any money getting ready to shoot whatever version of Axonar they're, they're going to make. Um, so they're going to have to raise this money first. They're going to have to figure out how they're going to tell the story they want to tell um, in thirty minutes, and they've got to do that uh, fairly quickly because they've got a a window in which they'll lose whatever. PR potential there is to get people's attention, uh, that's going to, that's going to, people are going to move on fairly, fairly quickly if they don't start something right away. So their time frame is in two weeks, they're going to come up with some idea about how they're going to pursue this 30 minute version. And then in the meantime, gear up to make money however they can. Um, so if you're on their mailing list anywhere, expect, uh, expect to be asked for money. Um, great. Yeah. <laughs> so, and, and, and if you, as part of your consideration and whether to do so, you know, I have an entire website for you to read that may help you make a decision one way or the other. I'd rather put my donations towards Axamonitor. <laughs> well, you know, the thing is, uh, Janet Gershen Siegel, who's on the GNT show, uh, mm -hmm. she and, um, uh, uh, her partner, uh, oh, her name is escaping me. Shauna Gilkison. Um, they're oh, yeah, doing from, uh, semantic shenanigans. Yeah, yeah. semantic shenanigans, and they um, they're going to be covering other kinds of semantic shenanigans around fan works, um, about uh, uh, around um, uh, copywriting fan works. Those are legitimate um, uh, issues, and they're going to become bigger issues. I think. Um, you know, my my 
friend and colleague at Plagiarism Today, Jonathan Bailey, um, he's been covering this to to a certain extent for several years now. Um, you know, even though he's more about plagiar- plagiarism uh, specifically, he also covers um, copyright issues more generally. And he, he may he wrote some of the best early articles analyzing Axanar and the lawsuit that anybody has done to date, including me. Um, so, so there's a, there's certainly uh, interest in in this topic and associated topics, um, and I'm taking a look to see how it kind of turns out for Axanar as they move into the the next phase of their existence, and seeing if there's other stories that uh, that are worth tracking down uh, to come out, and and then making a decision at that point about what the future of Ax Monitor is. But as long as there's an Axanar out there that is trying to raise money and trying to deliver what it uh, promised its donors it would deliver. Um, I'll be keeping tabs. Well, awesome. Well, I got to tell you what, man, uh, this has been an unbelievable hour of informational stuff. It is, <laughs> it is beyond what I could have hoped for and having you come on the show to talk about it. We can't thank you enough. I'm sure our listeners are going to really appreciate hearing what you have to say. And, and, and I know I speak for Bill where we can't thank you enough for being that site to give us the factual information for this case. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Well, it's my pleasure. And, and you know, hats off to you and all the other pat- podcasters who've also covered this story uh, over the past year because it's it really has been a, a community effort of people who care about Star Trek, people who care about fan films and don't want to see either of those two things uh, threatened by, by something like this. So um, there are a lot of people to, to thank for gathering information, sharing information, amplifying information, getting it out there. And, you know, I'm, I'm proud to have been one of them and to have count uh, and to count those folks as, you know, colleagues and friends now. So thank you. Well, Carlos, thank you so much. And uh, happy birthday, man. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to go have my pie now. I won't <laughs> sing because I tend to get cease and desist orders sent to me when I do that. So. <laughs> well, you know, happy birthday is copyright free now. That's, That's right. right. That's right. <laughs> thanks a lot, man. All right. Thanks a lot. Yeah, we truly can't thank Carlos Pedraza enough. I mean, his birthday, having to talk to you, answering all kinds of questions, you know, from us that that may have seemed completely vapid, but lots of great questions from Camp Kittimer, I have to say. But uh, truly, we can't thank Carlos enough, and it was a, an honor and a pleasure to have him on Trek Geeks. It really was. Uh, we've we've spoken uh, to him through Facebook from time to time. We've never really had a a conversation, and I got to tell you, I think I mentioned it to him right as we were wrapping up. That was an awesome conversation. I did not expect it to be that in depth and 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 detailed. It was awesome. And Carlos, once again, thank you so much. I'm sure our listeners really appreciate all the hard work that you've done, and now being able to sit with somebody like Bill for an hour and really just have to deal with it. <laughs> I think one of the things that highlights to me in particular is is the fact that he has just been so exhaustively fair Mm -hmm. in reporting Axanar. I mean, because he he wasn't reporting his opinion. He wasn't discussing his opinion to us. He was reporting facts. And I think anybody, especially in the pro Axanar crowd, who has leveled, you know, claims of, of him being, you know, biased, could not be more way off base, especially if you just read through the content at Axa Monitor. It really is amazing. Um, and we've, we've said it in different, in different conversations here and there is, is the, the people at Axanar and the people that follow and are pro Axanar can really learn a lot from people that are not involved in that group and how to handle themselves. And Carlos is a perfect example of how to, how someone should handle themselves for this whole situation. He handles it with class. He has facts. He's educated and he knows what he's talking about. And if you disagree with him, he's not going to swear and call you a whole bunch of names and then block you. And I think that's really something that a lot of people can learn from. Yeah, it's nice to actually talk with adults. Yes. Isn't it? Yep, it is. Well, I don't get to do that very often. <laughs> don't I know it? <laughs> <laughs> well, obviously, as we mentioned, people can find the website at axamonitor.com. Or if you want to find you know, Carlos on Twitter, you can go to twitter.com slash axamonitor. Um, 
always amazingly responsive to, to people that, uh, that ask questions. And again, we just, we truly can't thank him enough. Dan, we also can't thank enough the gents and the band Five Year Mission for providing all of the amazing music you hear on Trek Geeks every single week. They are, they're amazing. We're huge fans of theirs. And um, we, we are in their debt every single week for the, the, the quality of, uh, of entertainment they add to this podcast. They are fantastic. They've got, uh, they're working on some new stuff, is our understanding. So uh, we will continue to say that every week until it comes out because we can't wait to hear uh, the next batch of legendary music coming from the pipes and instruments of Five Year Mission. Without a doubt. And we hope everybody heads on out to fiveyearmission.net. Please download all their albums, as as Delwina did recently. Yes, our, our winner of the uh, last quarter's twenty five dollar Amazon um, gift card and the subscribe and review campaign. More about that in a second. But yeah, head on out to Five Year Mission, download all their tunes, learn them, live them, love them, and um, you know become a fan because we certainly are. Yeah, definitely. And you know what's cool, Bill? I found something. What's that? A hidden vault special, so to what? speak. What? Yeah, I mean, and I can only I can only describe it in like the old next week on Star Trek voice. It, it was a difficult time between the Federation and Klingon Empire, skirmishes, battles, and the galaxy on the brink of war. One band came up with a great plan to defeat the Empire, and this is their story. <laughs> Well, in, in all seriousness, we, we're never really going to be able to make this story, but we sure as hell are going to try and bend the rules to bring it to you because it deserves to be told, even if it is in a bunch of 15-minute webisodes. So, so yeah, check it out. It's Farksonar. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, you know, my nausea right now is like waves upon the firmament, okay? <laughs> I, I, to borrow a phrase. I'm, not, I'm just going to be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Sing us, please. FiveYearMission.net. Download some tunes. Uh, Dan, and mm. we mentioned just a moment ago our iTunes subscribe and review campaign, and we recently had a winner. We've got one last quarter of that going on right now, so we want everyone to head out to trekgeeks.com slash iTunes, learn how you can write a review for Trek Geeks, and uh, possibly win yourselves 25 bucks to Amazon.com. Sounds pretty great, doesn't it? That sounds pretty awesome. I like it. Well, excellent. Thank you for that uh, that biting commentary, Dan. <laughs> so, <laughs> now obviously, twenty five dollars in uh, in U.S. Amazon or yes. the equivalent in your country's version of Amazon. So that's trekgeeks dot com slash iTunes. Dan, why don't you regale us with what's happening next week? Well, next weekend's big. You know, uh, Super Bowl 51 is next weekend. Uh, So as Bill and I will be cheering on our New England Patriots on their quest for their fifth Super Bowl title, uh, our episode next week is going to be a a supplemental edition. It's going to be a little bit shorter than normal. uh, But what an edition it's going to be. You know, get ready, Bill, for the Super Bowl-sized stump the geek. Eek, 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 eek. I'm sorry, was that an echo? <laughs> <laughs> that should be fun. We haven't done one yeah. in a while. <laughs> we haven't. I am deep into writing questions for you to answer. And uh, I was going to tell you that the first two you're not going to get. Oh, okay. Challenge accepted. And we will see how you do. And I re- will remind you that you said that, sir. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Stump the Geek next week on the supplemental edition of Trek Geeks. And of course, for more great Star Trek discussion, we hope everybody heads on out to the Tricorder Transmissions online at thetricordertransmissions.com and listens to one of their podcasts. They've got something guaranteed for just about every Star Trek fan in the known galaxy. And of course, for all the latest news on everything Star Trek, please visit our great friends at treknews.net online at treknews.net. For now, this has been episode 91 of the Trek Geeks podcast. We do hope you all live long and prosper. You know, I'm really bummed that I'm not going to be able to buy any of that Kokar nut coffee from Axanar because I heard all the lawyers got it. Oh, boy. Hmm. <laughs> uh, I just, uh, all I can think of right now are Spartans. I'm sorry. <laughs>
Bing bong. Oh, we forgot to do the bing bong. <laughs> bing bong. How you doing, buddy? Good, buddy. What's going on? What's going on? It's uh, it's another day in paradise, my friend. It's always a day in paradise when I get to listen to you. If that paradise is a frozen tundra. Slice my throat open with a spoon. Oh, please. I well, hope so. Wow. So, hey, I got I got something to tell you. I, yeah. I, I, I posted about it earlier today. I just, it was unbelievable. So Sue and I go out to breakfast this morning. There's a place up the road about three miles, which we love. It's called Stone's Cafe. Good plug. They have breakfast there that is just amazing. And today, every Sunday, they have a special. It's sausage gravy and biscuits. Okay. Awesome. Mm, awesome. Awesome. And it comes with a side of two eggs, any, any way you want. So I order my eggs over medium because I love over medium. And when they come and when the dish gets to me, I take the eggs and I actually put it in the container of the sausage gravy and biscuits. And then I take my knife and fork and I cut it all up into, into bits and mix it all in. Okay. Did that today. No problem. So Sue and I are sitting there and we're talking and we're eating and, and I look down and on top of the sausage gravy egg mixture is a perfect cutout of a Starfleet Delta of my egg white. I am not making this up. I had I did not do it on purpose. It was complete just by cutting up my knife with my knife and fork. I could not believe it. How is that for karma? I had to take it and put it on the side of my plate and take a picture of it because I couldn't believe it. <laughs> and Sue's looking at me and she goes, "You are such a goober." <laughs> <laughs> she is. She said what I was thinking. It's amazing. <laughs> but it was cool. You saw? Did you see the picture yet? I did. Tell me, did you see William Shatner in your toast? <laughs> I have Cylon toast. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it was just, it was, it was really something. I just, ooh, uh, okay. That's oh, well, yeah. riveting. Yeah, I was just gonna say that. How was your day? <laughs> my day was, my day was pretty uneventful. I, uh, you know, I spent it. Uh, essentially with a snuggling puppy next to me, which uh, which wasn't terrible. We finally took down Christmas last night. Bro- oh, is that what that post was? Did you drop your Enterprise? No. <laughs> no. Dude, I'm not going to drop my Enterprise. I only dropped yours. Wow. That Thanks. Thanks, pal. I'm 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 a giver. Huh. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, you know, we put the tree up late, so we decided, you know, let's we'll, we'll take it down at some point. And for the last two weeks, we've been like, yeah, we should really take down the tree at some point. Oh, Until finally, sweet. last night, my wife came down with all the uh, all the the storage totes to to put like all the ornaments and stuff away. I said, "Yeah, yeah, I suppose <laughs> we should put the tree away, huh?" It's always sad to put the tree away. See, I yeah. don't even I don't actually put my Star Trek ornaments on the tree. We I I put them up a display around the windows in our living room, so I don't actually oh. have them on the tree except for Captain Kirk who goes up near the top. Yeah. Nor- normally, I have a separate Trek tree. Yes. I did not do that this year. Wow. Um, I just I did a a tree for my mom in my front window instead this year. Yes. But next right. year I'm going to do the separate Trek tree in my office, which I've done in years past. Yes. And the garland is usually red and green strands of Cat Five networking cable. <laughs> I I like that. It's like yeah. an IT. It's like an IT tree. Yeah. All it's right. Lot, you know I am uh, I I put the Trek and the Geek in my Trek tree. Okay. Whatever you say. Wow. <laughs> What's with all the judginess? I'm not judging. I think it's fantastic. I said it's an IT tree. I, I gave you a compliment, jerk. <laughs> You've been really defensive. I don't I do not. <laughs> <laughs> so can I give you some advice? I know that you don't have children, um, and I don't think you're going to have children. I am not having children. Okay. Well, for anybody else who is a fan of the show and and listens to the show, I'm going to offer a suggestion that you train your kids to do something or to not do something (laughs) very early. And Sue's already laughing because she knows what I'm going to talk about. We are turning my youngest daughter's room, Rebecca, the youngest, who's off in college now. Now that she's gone, I'm taking over the room. I guess, you know, I'll be selfish. Yeah, it's going to be my room now. (laughs) How big is the bed that's going to be in there for you to sleep on? (laughs) (laughs) There is going to be a bed in there because it is going to be a guest room when we have guests, but it's it's going to become my podcasting studio, actually. Sure it is. Sure. So we're going through the process of taking all of the bleep that was on her walls and putting it together to save or to get rid of based on what she tells us. So she had so many things on the wall, dude. It's it's amazing how many pictures and papers that she had on her wall. What I'll give you an example. 
One of them was maybe a five by eight, not even an eight by 10 piece of paper with a drawing because she's an artist and she does fantastic work. So she puts a lot of stuff up on her wall. And this one particular picture was five by seven or something like that. Have you ever heard it? Was it an eight by 10? Eight by 10. All right. Sue's correcting me. So eight by 10, you know, no, most people will take, you know, four pieces of tape maybe and put them either behind it or tape the corners. Right, right. Now, there's this stuff out there that you can get, and I think my mother-in-law got them for the kids. They're glue dots. Mm -hmm. If anybody ever gets kids glue dots, throw them away, burn them, flush them down the toilet, do whatever you need to do with them. Because Becca didn't put just four of the dots on this 8x10 piece of paper. There were about 35 of them. Oh, my God. And they don't come off the wall easily at all. <laughs> and that is for about – just that's just one picture. She has what? She had like, what, 20 pictures up on her wall? Yeah. Guess what I'm going to be doing for three days? <laughs> so so what you're saying is the glue dots work. They work. <laughs> yes. Yes. We had to get some goof-off material, which you spray on it and then let it sit, and you can scrape it off. But, oh, my God, 35 dots for one 8 by 10 paper. And duct tape. She used duct tape too. <laughs> what the? Was she preparing for a hurricane? <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I, I'll tell you what. If I ever duct tape or glue dotted stuff on my walls or door when I was a kid, I think my father would have put me like uh, up into orbit with his boot. <laughs> I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you this: you could have had a hurricane blow through your area of Maine. <laughs> It could have it could have leveled your house, and the only thing it would still be standing would be that wall with the damn pictures on it. <laughs> That's right, absolutely. Uh, God bless her. But yeah, don't 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 ever get anybody glue dots. People just don't do it. I know what I'm getting you for Christmas. Oh God, <laughs> <laughs> thanks a lot. <sighs> Not as good as the Boss Skaggs outtake, but still some very good information. I don't think anything could beat the Boss Skaggs. Nothing outtake. may ever beat that ever. I uh, any outtake where you can't breathe. <laughs> Or well, anytime you can't breathe really is a great time for yeah, me. I knew that was coming. I, I was going to say it before you did. Thank you. You uh, you ready to do this? Yeah, let's do it. All right. 